Hi, I'm Steve Halliday, and this is our next video in the series on Raspberry Pi bare metal programming. In this video, I'm going to talk about ARM processor modes. Now, the processing that we've done so far, we've ignored the different processor modes, and it's allowed us to work in kind of a simplified view of our processor. But we're trying to get ready so that in the next video we can do some interrupt handling. And in order to do that, we need to understand processor modes. So I'm going to introduce those during this video. Let's start by taking a look back at the current program status register, or the CPSR register. This register isn't one of our regular 16 registers, R0 through 15. This is a separate register. We haven't talked too much about it. We discuss the condition flags up here. When we do a compare, remember that some of these flags get set. The rest of these sections we've ignored and we haven't been able to use. In fact, you, we, we won't address status or extension. I'm not sure these are even being used at this point in the, in the CPSR. But this time, we'll talk about the control register a little bit here. Remember that we talked about that there are mode bits down here in the control register. And these five bits indicate which mode the processor is in. And here are the seven possible modes that you can be in. It turns out when you reset the Raspberry Pi or the ARM processor, it starts in supervisor mode. So everything we've been doing up to this point has been supervisor mode. If we wanted to go into one of the other modes from supervisor mode, we can actually write this bit pattern into these bits in the register and that can force us into one of the other modes. The user mode is a little different from the other modes in that the user mode is unable to write these bits directly. So you might be asking yourself, well, how do I get from user mode into one of these other modes? Well, each of these modes, you arrive there through an interrupt or some kind of an exception. This mode here, FIRQ, IRQ in both here and in the FIRQ mode stands for interrupt request. There are two different types of interrupts that the Raspberry Pi can handle. One is called a fast interrupt and one's called an, just a, a regular interrupt request. The fast interrupt, I think it's called fast interrupts because it saves a few extra registers, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But if you get a fast interrupt request, then the processor will immediately jump into this mode. Same with the regular non-fast request, I guess you'd call it. When you get a non-fast interrupt request, you'll immediately go into the IRQ mode. As I said, supervisor mode is the normal mode that we would run in in kernel mode. Abort mode occurs when there's a problem accessing memory. I suspect that you could use this as a basis for virtual memory types of operations. Undefined mode, it's not that the mode's undefined, <laughs> but it's when you try to execute an instruction that's not defined. So for example, if we encoded our instructions incorrectly, and we ended up with a bit pattern that wasn't supported by the processor, we would jump into this mode. This mode might be useful if you wanted to support a uh, coprocessor. So when you try to execute a command that the processor doesn't recognize, the processor would jump into undefined mode. And at that point, you could go off and you could access the coprocessor if you wanted to. And finally, system mode is another operating system type of mode. System mode and user mode are actually very similar. The only difference between these modes is that in system mode, I can access the control bits, whereas in user mode, I can't write to them. So these are the different modes that the processor can be in. As I said, when we reset the processor, we start in supervisor mode. If I wanted to go into user mode from supervisor mode, I could change the CPSR directly by changing these five bits. I would write in 10000, and that would put me in user mode. If I'm in user mode and I want to get to one of these other different modes, I'm unable to write these bits directly, so what I would need to do is have an interrupt occur, which would cause me to go into one of these other different modes. And we'll talk a little bit about how these interrupts work. An interrupt is like a subroutine call, but it differs from a subroutine call in a couple different ways. First of all, when you call a subroutine, of course, that doesn't automatically change the CPSR, the current program status register but an interrupt does. Secondly, 
Interrupts are like asynchronous subroutine calls, so there is no calling code that causes the interrupt to occur usually. There's one exception to that, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But interrupts are usually caused by some external event. Some hardware influences the processor in a way that causes an interrupt to occur. At low order memory, starting at location zero in memory, is what we call an interrupt vector. And what this vector is, is the location where interrupts are sent to. So for example, if the processor gets reset, then the value of 00, zero gets put into the program counter and the processor starts to execute at location 00. zero. Similarly, if you execute an undefined instruction, the processor will get sent to location 04 in memory, and you'll start to execute there, and so on and so forth. And you might ask yourself, well, what can I do here in four bytes in memory? Well, what you can do is you can jump to some other place in memory, and you can start to deal with whatever caused that interrupt. And so the interrupt vector contains usually a bunch of branch instructions or something similar to that, that get you off to the routines to handle each of these different situations. Here I've listed the interrupt vector for the ARM processor. There's seven values in it. This happens when we reset the processor. This next one, this undefined instruction, as I said in the previous slide, this interrupt occurs when we hit some instruction that the processor doesn't recognize. This third vector location here is the software interrupt. We can actually cause a software interrupt to occur in user mode. And normally, this is what happens with an operating system call. The user code causes a software interrupt to occur, which then puts us into a privileged state in the processor. And at this point, we can check and make sure that the registers contain reasonable values. And this allows us to have some security around the operating system. The prefetch abort and data abort. Prefetch abort is when we try to access memory with an instruction where the memory doesn't exist. And this would allow us to branch out in our virtual memory and map in some other memory. And similarly, a data abort happens when we try to access some memory for data where the memory address isn't, doesn't exist. This location isn't assigned an interrupt value at this point, so we don't have any way to cause this one. And then finally, we have a regular interrupt request and the fast interrupt request. And I'm going to talk about what each of these do. It turns out that on the Raspberry Pi, if I understand correctly from the documentation, any hardware event can cause both of these to occur, but we'll mask off one we'll mask off the fast interrupts and we'll just deal with the regular interrupts for the stuff that we're going to do in our next exercise. So you might be saying to yourself, I kind of get what an interrupt is. It's a subroutine that occurs when some external factor affects the processor. And you might be asking yourself, so what's the big deal with all these processor modes? And what do they have to do with anything? Well, what happens is the different processor modes allow you to access different registers. Up to this point, the registers that we've accessed, we've, we've assumed that there are 16 general purpose registers, R0 through R15 and that there's one CPSR register. And this is actually true as long as you stay in one specific mode. But if you change modes, then the registers you access, even though they're called the same thing, are actually different registers. Now there's only one CPSR register for the entire processor. So no matter what mode you're in, you're always in the CPSR state. But when an interrupt occurs, the value that's in the CPSR gets put into a special register called the SPSR or the saved processor state register. And each of these different modes has its own saved processor state register. So here's the way this works. If I'm in user or system mode and I access any of these registers, let's say I put a value of 42 in register zero. If I'm in fast IRQ mode, I would also see that 42 here. But if I were in user mode and I put a value of 42 in register 8, and then I go into fast IRQ mode, I wouldn't see a, a 42 in register 8 any longer. And similarly, I could put a value of, say, 19 in register 8 in fast IRQ mode, 
and then when I go back into user mode I would see the 42 still in register 8. And so what this diagram shows is what are called register banks. User and system mode share all the same registers but FastIRQ mode has these registers that are completely separate. And even though I might use the same instructions to access the registers, in other words, I might move a value into register 8, if I'm in fast IRQ mode, when I move a value into register 8, it moves it into this register. And if I'm in user mode, it moves it into this register. These are actually physically separate registers in each of, for each of these modes. And so you can see that fast IRQ mode has these additional registers, whereas these other modes only have a separate stack pointer and a link register. Remember the link register holds the return address. And in an interrupt, it turns out that the link register actually does continue to hold the return address from the interrupt. So when you're done with your interrupt, one of the things that you'll want to do is to copy the return address back to the program counter. And we'll show that in the next set of videos where we actually do some interrupts. The final topic I want to cover in this video is how to set up my stack pointer for the different modes of the processor. Remember in the previous slide that each of these different modes has its own stack pointer. So how do I go into these different modes and set them up? Here is a snippet of code that shows how to do just that. I use this new instruction called the MRS instruction. This is the instruction specifically set up to get the value of the CPSR and move that into a, a different register so I can actually read it. So this is reading the status register or it's basically taking the status register and putting it into a regular register. Once I've done that I want to strip off the low order 8 bits which are the bits that contain the mode value. These are the uh, control bits in the CPSR and so by anding all these bits and masking off these two lower order nibbles, I can keep all the higher order bits and turn these lower order bits into zeros. Then I can replace the zeros with this D2, which is the mode for IRQ. And so I construct what the new CPSR value will look like in register zero here. And then I use this MSR instruction. This was an MRS instruction. This is an MSR instruction to write from register zero into the CPSR. This allows me to move into the IRQ mode in the register. And once I'm in this mode, I can now set the stack pointer. In this example, I'm going to set it to 2000 hex. So I write that into register 13, which sets up my stack pointer to start at location 2000 hex. Then if I want to go back into the SVC mode, which is the mode that I started in, I do basically the same thing. But the thing that I change is the mode bits here. Instead of D2, which puts me in IRQ mode, I'll put in D3, which puts me in supervisor mode and I order those bits in and I write that back to the CPSR and then I'm back in supervisor mode and I've decided I'm going to start my stack for supervisor mode here at location 3000 hex. This keeps these two stacks separate, gives me a thousand hex room for my IRQ stack, assuming that my stack is growing in increasing order. I'll have a thousand hex locations that I can use for my stack before I end up writing over my supervisor stack. So that gives us a general overview of the concepts that we need to know about processor modes and I look forward in the next video to actually tackling a real interrupt.